I really need to get into this next section. So the barrier is um, probably the most important synchronization construct to the typical OpenMP programmer. It defines a point where all the threads wait until everyone arrives before anyone moves forward. Now, in this particular example, it's real important because what I'm going to talk about is what a barrier does, how you would probably use it, and where it's implied. Because you've been using barriers already, even though you don't know it. So imagine this example. Let's take a few minutes to think about this example. I have three great big arrays, A, B, and C. All right? And there's are some great big values. I don't know. I don't care. They're big. All right? I'm going to enter a parallel region. So this is that SPMD, single program, multiple data style of programming, where I'm going to execute all the code redundantly, and they're going to know who their idea is, and that's going to change what they do. So every thread picks up its ID. Then it's going to do some big, ugly, horrible calculation and park the value in an element of the array A. All right? That's what it's going to do. Um, now, I'm going to use that array later on. So no one can go on and do anything, none of the other threads, until I know everyone is done with that array. All right? So logically, I have to tell everyone, wait. Don't go on until everyone's done. So pragma OMP barrier sticks a barrier in the code. All right, now I go on, and now I'm going to have a loop that's going to take the values of A, and it's going to compute the elements of C. All right? So for i equals 0, i less than c, so I do a pragma OMP4. All right? Now notice, notice the team of threads that are bound to are defined up here in this parallel, right? So this is, when I write code, I almost never, almost never write pragma OMP parallel 4. You, you will, you'll rarely see that in any real applications I work with. I always move the pragma, the pragma OMP parallel out as high up to the top as I can get it. So at any rate, pragma OMP4, I'm going to compute the array C, and I look ahead and I realize I'm going to use it later on. So I want to make sure all of the threads finish before anyone goes on. But I don't need to put a barrier there, because we want to make OpenMP so by default it's safe. Remember, we're trying to be the friendly, high-level programming model for application programmers. I always get a kick out of it when people criticize OpenMP for being too low level. So it's like, yeah, right. <laughs> you write P threads. Have you ever written any C++ 11 threads? Talk about low level. Um, you know, we're the high level easy stuff. And yeah, I admit it gets difficult, but that's because parallel programming is not easy. Anyway, we, we imply a barrier because that's the safest thing to do. So, barrier is implied. Now I look ahead and I have another loop, pragma OMP4. I'm going to compute an array B, but I notice that I'm not using it in the loop, I'm not lose, using it afterwards. So, a barrier would be over synchronization. I don't need a barrier. I don't need to wait. When I'm done with B, I can immediately go and do that next statement. So I'm telling OpenMP, I know what I'm doing. Trust me, don't put the barrier at the end of the loop. So I do that with the no wait clause. Pragma OMP for no wait says, ignore that barrier. Don't put a barrier there. All right? So then, when I'm done with this, no barrier. As the threads finish, they immediately go to their last big calc to fill A. Then they hit the end of the parallel region. And that parallel region, there is an implied barrier there, and there's no way to turn it off. Meaning, the master thread from the sequential part will not continue until all the threads get there. And there's no way there for you to, to turn that off. In other words, you can put a no weight on the work share constructs like four, and we're going to talk about a few of the other work share constructs. You can put a no weight on a work share construct. You cannot put a no weight on a parallel. The implied barrier at the end of a parallel region is always going to be there. There's nothing you can do about it. All right? Any questions? I think what I covered here is pretty straightforward, but it's, uh, you know, there's several pieces to it. All right. Master construct, real easy. It's, it's uh, actually, well, people use it a lot with hybrid programming. And it says pretty much what you think it would say. It says uh, the, the master thread will do the code within this construct. Everyone else just skips it. So there's no synchronization implied. There's no barrier implied. So the master thread will do 
what's inside that construct, everyone else goes on. So if I'm doing a model of hybrid programming where I want one thread to do all the MPI, I would like, this is where I'd put my MPI calls, for example. So uh, that's one, that's, that's personally where I, I see it used. Okay? Now, let's talk about single work sharing construct. So single, I think, is, is a grossly underappreciated construct. Um, but it's actually pretty cool. So the key single construct denotes a block of code that is executed by only one thread. But this time, it's not necessarily the master thread. It's not, you're not saying which thread. You're saying that the first thread that gets here to this single will execute the code. Everyone else, well, what are they going to do? It's a work share construct, so what happens to everyone else? There's a barrier implied. So one thread, whichever one, I don't know, will do this operation, exchange boundaries. The other threads will wait right here at the implied barrier before they go on. That's the single construct. Now, I could put a no wait on the single construct. And this is one thing I love playing around with. I don't, I don't know of many implementations that do it right. But think about it if I put a no wait on there. Well, now, one thread's going to do it. Everyone else goes on. So what if I have a loop, and inside the loop is a single construct, and I'm using it to create a set of tasks? Because I'm going to put a single no wait on each one of those constructs. So I'm going to end up with distributing all these executions. Each task will be the, the contents of that loop. But, I mean, there's, there are some tricked out things you can do with that single construct when you put a no wait on it. But it gives you a way of, sh you know, it's, it's still a work sharing construct. You are still looking at a block of code, and you are sharing the work between threads. That's why we call it a work sharing construct. So it is a work sharing construct. It's not a synchronization construct. It's a work sharing construct that implies a barrier, and it's used to give some work that one thread does. All right. No questions? Say, I like this. We get to move fast. Oh, you had a question. Oh, man, you're messing it up. It better be a good one. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry, if you, sorry if you said this, but which thread executes what's inside single? Gosh, it's not even a good question. Man, no, sorry. <laughs> I don't need to put you down. I did say it, but you didn't hear it. OK. You don't know, you, and you have no way to tell. A thread will, will do that single, will we'll do this code. Or, I mean, do you have a way to tell? Well, yes, I mean, you have a way to tell inside. I can, I can check. I can say, you know, OMP. But what I'm saying is, is there's no clause that says, pragma OMP single, thread number such and such does the work. You know, you can say, a thread, one thread of the team does this work. And then inside, between these brackets, I can put any legal code including an ID equals OMP, get thread num. But the idea of single is it's your way of saying, I have a team of threads. This team of threads is doing a bunch of stuff. I want one member of the team to go off and do this while the others wait. That's what single is. And I don't care which thread of my team goes off and does that. Um, but I want one, this one thread to go off and do something while everyone waits. And then if I don't want them all to wait, I can put a no wait on there. Now, there's a reason, uh, you know, a lot of people teaching OpenMP would skip this construct, especially in the old days. But as you'll see later on, it, it gets used a lot these days when you start looking at the tasking models. OK, now I'm going to go quickly through this one, because this is one that I don't think people use an awful lot. But, oh, wait, a, another question. OK, but this will be a good one, right? <laughs> uh, in the master, the barrier was implied? No, there is no, there is. There is no barrier on master. And why is it different in the asymmetry in this? Here it is. Because that's how we designed it. Um, I'm sure if I sat here and thought long enough, I could think about a reason. But uh, we, I, don't, I don't remember the reason why we didn't imply it. It's not a work sharing construct. We're being internally consistent. Work sharing constructs imply barriers. Let, OK, let me, be, let me explain something. In a well-designed. API. It is a work sharing construct. Master is not considered a work sharing oh, construct. Master is not. Single master is. Master is not. 
Yeah. I See, I know the spec. You you may be better on 4.0 no, fast. No, I misunderstood your, your statement. <laughs> I thought you were saying single is. All right, all right, all right. I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah. No, in a well-designed API, your goal is that somebody understanding the principles is likely to guess the right syntax. So it's very, very important for us to be consistent. So we made the decision long ago, back in the early, early days, when, when I was just this high, no. <laughs> um, back in the old days, we made the decisions that work share constructs, their safe application should imply a barrier. But a barrier is, is a brutal thing. I mean, think about what you're saying when you put a barrier somewhere. You're saying all the threads stop and wait. You know, that can clobber your performance. So you want to be very, very careful where you imply and where you, where you put barriers. So with master, since it's not a work share construct, consistency didn't demand a barrier there. And frankly, the way we imagine people using it didn't require a barrier. Um, but if you need one, like actually, in my example, I kind of need one. If I want to you know, think I'm doing a geometric decomposition, do a bunch of stuff, exchange the boundaries, do a bunch of other stuff, there I need the barrier, so I put it there explicitly. OK, so. But on the flip side, you can put no weight on single, so. Yeah. You can put no weight on single. All right, I'm just going to go through this one very quickly. So the sections and section constructs. What they basically do is they give you a way to say, I have these blocks of code. I want to give one block to one thread, another block to another thread, and another block to another thread. That's basically what it does. So it's a work share construct. I declare pragma OMP parallel. I always have to do that because I want to create a team of threads. Okay. I then have pragma OMP sections, which is telling the system, get ready for blocks of code where I'm going to hand them out to different threads. OK? Then I have one or more pragma OMP section. And they can be a block of code. They can be between curly braces. So Fortran programmers, there's a pragma OMP N section. So, uh, so you can put multiple statements in there. But you know, I got one thing I'm doing in the x dimension, one thing I'm doing in the y dimension, one thing I'm doing in the z dimension. I don't care which threads do them. I just want to do work sharing and make sure one thread does one of each. That's section and sections. Personally, I don't use this very much, if, if, if at all, in recent memory. But, but for completeness, we mentioned it there. All right, now, locks. Good question. OK. It's all right. Can you use multiple threads within each session? Can you use multiple threads for each session? So can you use multiple threads in each section? Well, now, no. For what you're saying, what you're asking, no, you can't. You're going to get one thread do one section, one thread do another section, one thread do another section. Now, I can put a parallel region inside a section, so I could do nested parallelism. So I could, you know, basically inside the brackets for a section. I can have another parallel region with pragma OMP4. I can do all sorts of crazy stuff. But there's no way for me to say, I'd like three threads to do the first section, one thread to do the next. No. OK, let me say a little bit about locks. Locks are included in OpenMP for people who need more control over synchronization. And if you're building up more complex synchronization protocols, so this is another thing I want to just touch on for completeness. I'll tell you quite honestly, the majority of OpenMP programmers probably don't have a lot of business using locks. There's a reason we put these high-level synchronization constructs into OpenMP. They're safer. They're the right things to use. But the fact of the matter is there are times you just need this low-level hammer called a lock. So a lock. Basically, how many people have worked with locks in threaded environments? OK, so, so some of you, but not a lot of you. Okay, I apologize to you more experienced people then. I'm going to bore you for a moment. All right, a lock is an opaque object. So it's got a data type. So there's a type for locks. All right, then you're going to have something to initialize the lock because it's an opaque object. You don't see its actual initial value. So you have to be able to initialize the lock. And then you can set a lock or un unset a lock. Now, if you set a lock, then you own the lock. We say that the thread that sets the lock holds the lock. If another thread comes along and tries to set that same lock, it will wait. It will wait until that lock becomes unset. 
then it can set the lock. So this is a way of having fine-grained control over mutual uh, ex mutually ex mutual exclusion. So, um, and the best way to go and describe this is with an example. Okay, imagine I have a histogram that I want to process in parallel. All right, so I'm going to run through a big mass of data, and I'm going to define buckets, and I'm going to assign values of the buckets. I'm going to assign values of the data to which bucket they go in, sum that up to get a histogram corresponding to the data. That's the problem I'm going after. Now, I want you to pause for a moment and think about how you would implement that. Histogram, well, it's going to be an array. It's going to be an array of buckets. So it's going to have, you know, if there's n buckets, I'll have, uh, well, yeah, I'll have n buckets. And I'm going to have an array of size n buckets and bucket 0 to bucket n buckets minus 1. That's great. Now, I want to be careful. I'm going to do this in parallel. That means I'm going to have multiple threads testing what bucket do you go in. And then it will increment the appropriate value of the histogram. Now I've got a problem. Because what happens if two threads at one time try to increment the same bucket in the histogram? We call that, let's get it together, it's a, a race condition. That's right, it's a data race. All right? And the rules of modern programming languages says that if, if your program has a data race, the result of that program is undefined. So, and I've often joked that since every program has a data race, if I were writing a compiler, every program would just sort of print zero, and it'd be really, really fast. <laughs> but <laughs> that's a little too cynical. <laughs> but to prevent the data race then, the function that accesses the histogram array, I would just put it in a critical section. Wouldn't that work? Wouldn't that work? Yes, it would work really well. Well, wait a minute. Now I've serialized access to that histogram. The performance would be abysmal, absolutely abysmal. Because let's face it, chances are, if I have a fairly random distribution of that big set of data, the chances are no two threads are going to try to be accessing the same element of the histogram at the same time. Chances are there'll be different parts of the histogram. OK, so here's how I solve that. I'm going to have a lock for each element of the histogram. So for each element of the histogram, I, each bucket of the histogram, I will have a separate lock. So there I have OMP init lock of my array of locks for the histograms. Now when I go through in the next loop, pragma OMP parallel 4, gosh, I break my own rule. That is embarrassing. Oh, I'm going to fix that. Oh, well. That, I should have one pragma OMP parallel at top and the fours. I apologize. <laughs> but <laughs> any rate, so you can see right here, in my, my, you know, the heart of my loop where I'm going, the heart of my program where I'm going through and filling that histogram, I check the value, and then I just check the lock corresponding to the bucket that value is head, heading for. And I lock just that element and then increment it. So chances are, if all of these histogram buckets are not being accessed by the same thread at the same time, this should go really, really, really fast. So this is where you would use locks. And if you don't have a situation like this, you should probably stay away from them. But there are times you want to build into you know, the, 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 the member functions that are manipulating a data structure of some sort that you want to make threads safe but efficient. These are where you tend to use locks. All right, now we're almost done. This is kind of like a grab bag. Let's just get a bunch of stuff out of the way. All right. Now, there's a number of runtime library routines that we've been talking about. Let me finish the list by talking about the ones that people tend to use. And no, I'm not trying to do an exhaustive list. So you've seen OMP set num threads, OMP get num threads, OMP get thread num. There's one called OMP get max threads, which is the maximum number of threads that you would be given access to at the point you call it. Um, there's another one that lets you tell, are you actually inside a parallel region? Think about it. If I have a function that has a pragma OMP4 in it, and I call it, and sometimes I want to know, am I inside a, a parallel region, or am I not inside a parallel region? And you may want to know something different you want to do, depending whether the function's called inside an open MP parallel region or not. So that's where OMP in parallel is a function that lets you query. Am I actually inside a parallel region? All right, now, the system can try to be really clever 
and dynamically vary the number of threads from one parallel region to the next. Remember, it's a fork join model. Fork off a team of threads, do a bunch of stuff, join back together, go along, fork off a team of threads. OK, the system can try to get really, really clever and dynamically vary that number of threads to optimize the program. That's called dynamic mode. So you can see if you're in dynamic mode with the get dynamic, or and then you can set dynamic to turn it off. And then there's a code that you can call for how many actual hardware threads, how many processors does the system think I, there are. That's what, um, that's what uh, OMP numprox does. So for example, if I wrote some code where I really, really cared about how many threads I had, then I would turn off dynamic mode with OMP set dynamic zero. I would say set the number of threads, and let's say I wanted one thread per hardware, uh, per hardware element you know, for hardware thread. Then I would do OMP set num threads, OMP num procs. And then I go into my parallel region and, uh, you know, I can do lots of stuff. So this is, you know, if I write code where I really want to make sure I have one thread per virtual core, that was how I would do it. All right, so, and then move on. And then there's a set of environment variables. And uh, we haven't played with these yet, but they're actually very useful. So. We've been playing with code where you call OMP set num threads. You compile into your program how many threads to use. In real life, you would never do that. You would want to have more dynamic control at runtime over how many threads there are. So the typical way you do it is you don't set it inside the program at all. There's an environment variable, OMP num threads. So then you can set that, export it, and then it will pick up how many threads you want to use from the environment. And that's one that people use all the time. You, know, you, you would even use it in a class like this if you wanted to try one threads, two threads, four threads, eight threads. This way you don't have to recompile. Um, you can pass in the schedule you want to use through an environment variable. This is really useful when you're tr not sure which schedule to use on a parallel loop. So this gives you an easy way to change that just uh, at runtime. And then there's, uh, you can tell the system whether you, want the, um, whether you want the threads bound to a process or not. So those are just a few of the environment variables. But the whole idea here is to give the person running the application some way to interact with the OpenMP runtime system to control how the program runs. Because I want us to get through this data environment stuff. We've hinted at this enough, and I think I can go through this pretty quick and then turn you loose on another exercise, because you've been listening to me talk far more than anyone cares to listen to me talk. So <laughs> remember, in OpenMP, it's a shared memory programming model. You know, it's, it's a crude oversimplification, but it's surprisingly effective. That for the most part, variables are shared. You know, if you declare them before the parallel region, they're pretty much shared. If you declare them inside the parallel region, they're pretty much not shared. All right? So, Global variables, though, are shared. So in Fortran, if I have common blocks, save variables, module variables, they're shared. All right? If I have file scope variables, that are variables that are declared static, they're shared. All right? Um, so if I have dynamically allocated me uh, memory, you know, with the allocator, the malloc, or the new, they're shared. OK, here's another really, really crude rule of thumb. If the variables are sitting in that heap that all the threads can see, they're shared. If the variables are sitting in the thread stack, they're private. Private means only the thread can see it. Shared means all the threads can see it. All right? So let's look at this example right here. So I've got a, an array A of 10 int uh, main, I have another array, index of 10. I'm going to call a parallel, pragma OMP parallel. I'm calling a single function work inside of there. If we look at that function work, it has a reference to the double, the file scope double. That's extern uh, double of A. Uh, then we pass in the array index. Then I declare an array temp. And I have a static int count. So just to make sure you understand the rules, let's walk through this. So when I am in my sequential part, a, index, and count are defined. Count because it's a static, right? A, because it's file scope. Uh, index because it's declared prior to the parallel region, so it's sitting on the heap. So when I come into the parallel region, those continue to be shared. 
But temp is declared inside the function. It is private to each one of the threads. When you get to the end of the parallel region, the private variables go out of scope. They go away, so temp goes away, and I'm left with a indexing count. Does that all make sense? All right, good. So there are ways for you to manipulate the storage attributes of variables. And these are important when you start working with real programs. And when I say real programs, I, think, I mean things more complicated than these little tiny toys you've been playing with. All right? So there are clauses that we can add to OpenMP constructs to manipulate the data environment. So if I there's a shared clause. They all have the form as name of the clause, and then a parentheses, and then a comma-separated list. So I can declare that things are shared, which is the default case. But it basically says variables that are visible as we enter this construct, so from the scope outside the construct, these variables will be shared by all the threads inside the construct. Private. Private says this list of variables, which are visible, they're in the scope of the thread that's calling the construct. But inside the construct, we will create a private copy, a copy that is local to each thread. So private, comma, separated list. Those private variables are created uninitialized. I can't strike that. I can't stress that enough. But you know, that shouldn't surprise you. If I have, a, you know, if I have pragma o and p parallel bracket int x, what's the value of x? It's, 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 you didn't initialize it. In C, even in Fortran, I think, if you don't initialize it, it, it it's got no value. It's garbage. Okay? Well, that's the same thing with private variables. They're created. They have no value. All right? First private creates a private variable, but will, it will assign it the value of the variable from the scope that calls the construct. Right? So if I have x again, int x equals 42, then I have first private x as a clause on a parallel region. It will create a private copy of x for each thread. And then it will say, what was the value of x in the preceding scope, in the global scope of this construct, in the enclosing scope of this construct? Oh, it was 42. It will assign it to 42. So first private is what you use to give it a value to each thread. That's first private pi. What? You could have said first private. Yes, first private pi would give a copy of a variable called pi for every thread. And since I initialized it to 0 in the low global scope, I would now have a copy of pi with a value of 0 for on each thread. It's exactly how you use it. Now, these other ones aren't used quite so much, but there's another one called last private. Now, shared private, first private can go on work sharing constructs. It can go on a parallel region. Last private is just for work sharing constructs, just the loop, actually. And it basically says the variable for the thread that executed the last iteration of the loop. I want that value. Sounds kind of picky, but, but you know, if I have a thread going over, well, I'll, I'll give you an example of it in a moment. Now, I want to mention this last one, because this is one I use a lot. Default private, default shared, default none. Um, this lets you change the defaults. Okay? The, what it basically says is, by default, what do you want OpenMP to do with variables visible to the thread calling the construct. What do you want it to do? OK, the default is shared. But you can set default none. And boy, let me tell you, default none is really valuable. It is a debugging tool that you should love. Because default none says, I'm going to require that you explicitly declare the data environment status of every variable. So it forces you to go through and understand what should be private, what should be shared, what should be first private. All right. So if you declare default none as a clause on your OpenMP construct, then uh, it will force you to declare the, the, the shared and private status. Then there's default private, which says we're going to make all those variables that are visible when you call the construct private. I've personally never used it, but it's there. And it's only available in Fortran. And I find it very interesting why it's only available in Fortran. As I was told years and years and years ago 
long, long, long ago, gosh, 20, not quite 20 years ago. There are times I feel quite old. At any rate, <laughs> there are things that look like variables in the C library that are actually macros. And there was no way the compiler people could figure out how to make private versions of those. Therefore, they stated that in C and C++, they will not allow you to have default private. So it's you Fortran people only. Um, and Fortran people love it because you, you don't have as much flexibility where, where you declare things. You know, in C and C++, if you need something declared, you just declare it. But Fortran, you get in this style of you put all your declarations up at one point. And so default private actually was a real labor saver if you had a, a whole block of stuff that you just wanted to import into every thread. So at any rate, so I'm going to skip these examples because I don't think, were there any questions about these? <laughs> I mean, really, they're pretty clear. And, and it's better to just sort of. And, and it's a trade off, right? I mean, we have so much time. And so we can either go into more detail on, on these clauses, which I think we've already kind of touched on as we were going through the examples this morning, or and not hit some other stuff that we would otherwise cover. Yeah, I, I really want to just move on. So uh, here's a test. Here is an exam, all right? <laughs> Here you go. Imagine I have variables a, b, and c, and I've initialized them each to value 1. Now I have a pragma OMP parallel, and I've declared that private b and first private c. All right, so here's a question. Are A, B, and C local to each thread or shared inside the parallel region? Which is shared and which is private? Just think. Don't raise your hand and, and, and blur out an answer. I want all of you to have an answer to that question. So you can tell me for A, B, and C, which one's going to be private to each thread. I should say private, not local there. I will fix that. So which, which of those are private? Which of those are shared? OK, I want you all to have an answer to that. Now, I want you all to have an answer. What are their initial values inside the parallel region? OK? Inside the parallel region, what's the value of A? What's the value of B? What's the value of C? And then I want you to think about what are the values after the parallel region? You ready? Here we go. All right. So A is shared by all threads, right? Because I didn't list it on one of those clauses. So we get the default status of A, which is shared. All right? It's shared, and as it enters the parallel region, it equals 1. B and C are private to each thread. Once again, I apologize for using the word local. The proper word there should be private. All right? They are private to each thread. B, since it was declared private, has an uninitialized value. But C, since I declared it as first private, it's going to create the private copy and then assign it the copy outside just prior to the parallel region, right? which is 1. Now, following the parallel region, B and C go out of scope, so they revert to their original values, which is 1. And A, since it's shared, it has whatever values you set it to inside the parallel region. Okay. Now, we're coming to our third big head nod moment. Did everyone get that? Everyone, no. What, you, you two didn't get it? Look, folks, haven't we learned by now? I need to see head nods. OK, did everyone get this? You didn't get it. What, what, do, you a, do you have a question? You didn't nod your head, though. Did you, oh, you did get OK, good. Did anyone not get it? All right, good. So I have a little bit more I want to talk about, and it has to do with tasks. Tasks are an incredibly important recent recent addition to, uh, to OpenMP. So even uh, Bill Gropp, my good friend, uh, Bill Gropp, when he gave his talk about hybrid MPI in OpenMP, I was very good and held my tongue because he said something that irritates me to no end. <laughs> OpenMP, it's good for loop level parallelism. I was like, no, no. <laughs> yes, it's good for loop level parallelism. But if you talk to hardcore OpenMP programmers, at least the ones I mix with, we do more of that SPMD style than loop level. You know, create a bunch of threads with a parallel region, look at my ID, figure out what I'm going to do. Yeah, I'll put a parallel loop in there sometime, but I'll do a lot more than parallel loops. And this is because I want to manage my overheads. I want to control when am I going to hit the overhead of entering a loop and creating teams of threads and destroying teams of threads. 
I'm sorry, I'm going to be doing an awful lot more than just a parallel loop. If you look at a real program, there's a lot going on that's not just a parallel loop. And OpenMP is not just for loop level parallelism. Yes, OpenMP 1.0. It's like the person who attacks MPI. You know, MPI, it sends and receives. Oh, man, that's just hard. It's like, dude, there's two sided communications, there's, there's collectives, there's, there's an awful lot more to MPI than just send and receive. So if you're going to criticize MPI, at least criticize MPI 3.0 or 2.0. But don't go and tell me with MPI 1.1 that you're going to pick on it. I see that so much. Right? Same thing with OpenMP. You know, we got a lot of cool stuff in here, like tasks. So a task is an independent unit of work. And a task consists of some code to execute. And a task consists of a data environment that's associated with the task. And a task has an associated set of internal control variables. Now, if you read the spec, and I would urge those of you who plan to do very, very serious OpenMP programming, download the spec and read it. Now, as someone who has spent a big chunk of my career working on specs, I can honestly tell you the OpenMP spec is one of the best written specs I know of. Thank you, Bronis who leads, who herds the cats to make that happen. It, it, it actually is a spec you can read and understand what's going on. But you'll see how incredibly complicated it is to get all this stuff right. And tasks were not an easy thing to add. But we've added them, and we are very proud of them. Because what tasks allow you to do is create these units of work, create a team of thread, and say, OK, team of threads. You figure out, you take that, those tasks, and you execute them. So this allows me to defer tasks for later execution. Or I can execute them immediately. But I can create like a queue or a data structure that holds a set of tasks. And then I can go and work on them. So it greatly increases the range of patterns I can associate, the range of parallel patterns I can uh, 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 attack with OpenMP. So very, very powerful. So for example, it, I mean, it looks very simple. We added a task construct. So pragma OMP task creates this block of takes this block of code. That's the work associated with it. There are rules for the data environment associated with the task. So it captures a data environment. And it can either execute it right away, or it can defer it. So you build up tasks and then execute later on. That's how the task works. Yes? What's the difference between task and section? You know, they, they're, they're, they overlap. Because in both, so a section is a work sharing construct that's creating a static unit of work that I'm queuing up for, for execution. Okay? So in that regard, it's very similar to a task. The task is much more general. There's a lot of things I can do with the task I can't do with a section. So and we'll. Last line is, captures, seems like a very small point, but it's probably the single biggest difference. You can't have a section in a section. So I can create a vast pile of tasks by nesting tasks within tasks, which nest even more tasks. And this allows me to queue up work that teams of threads can work through and execute. So it gives me a level of dynamic algorithm structures that I can support that I could not before. And we'll, we'll, we'll see more. So let's, let's go through a careful example here. And this gives you a pattern for a common use of, of the task construct. So here I'm going to have a team of threads that I'm going to create. Pragma OMP parallel. I create a team of threads. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a while loop that's going to walk through a data structure and do some work for each element of that data structure. So I create the team of threads to that parallel construct. Now, one thread is going to go through the loop and create all the tasks. OK? So pragma OMP single, it's going to uh, grab the head of the node, and then it's going to have a while loop. And inside that while loop, it's going to call a task. And it's going to create a set of tasks. So as it goes through that while loop, that thread is going to walk through that loop, thread L, the loop that has the single, will walk through that while loop and will create a set of tasks. And it's going to execute some work for each one of those tasks. All right? 
So now it's created a set of tasks. Now, each task will be assigned to some thread to execute. You don't know which, but it's going to execute some thread. Keep in mind, I create a team of threads. One thread's going to be the single. It's going to do this loop. What are the other threads doing at this time? They're waiting at the end of the single. Remember? The single implies a barrier. One thread does the work of the single. The others wait at the end. What are those threads going to do? What? They're going to work on the tasks. So while the one thread is going through, creating the, the pile of tasks to work on, the other threads will, will start executing those tasks. So this gives me a way of dynamically executing tasks that are created by, uh, by, by, by another thread. Okay? And all the tasks will create, when I get to the barrier at the end, when I get to the barrier at the end of the single, it will not continue past that barrier until all the threads have completed the set of tasks. To drive this home, we have a cartoon version of this. Because I really want to make sure you understand this. All right? So the serial, block one is that while loop. Block two, it's going to do the processing of the element of that loop at a node. And then I'm going to go to the next. That's block three. So you can see serial, I have the while loop, process the, uh, the, do the processing associated with the node, increment to the next, do the processing associated with the node, increment to the next node, do the processing associated with the node. So that's the way it would happen, serial, with one thread. But if I have multiple threads, one way it would execute might be that one thread worries about the loop and it worries about the increment to the next element. And while it's going through and doing this, it's putting the tasks into some kind of queue, some kind of data structure. I have to be careful because queue implies that I'm saying how it's implemented. And I'm not saying how it's implemented. All right? So it's putting it in some kind of task queue where it's the tasks are waiting to be executed. All right? So thread one is going to go through. And it's going to walk through the while loop. It's going to grab, it's, it's gonna grab a, a pointer to the, to the linked list. It's going to define a task as processing that uh, function for that value. All right? And it's going to put that into a queue. And then it's going to go and go to the next one and repeat that until it hits the end of the loop. Then the other three threads in this parallel team will go ahead and process those tasks. And assuming they're very different regions, very different uh, uh, times to execute, I get that uh, a lot of time saved and good dynamic load balancing. All right? Does this make sense? Any questions? Yes? This can also be implemented by finding out what is my ID and is it equivalent to that? All right. What ID is and? Let me. Let me hold off on, on getting too far down that rat hole. Right? One of the exercises I want you to do tonight <laughs> is in the challenge problem section, I have a simple linked list. All right? it, it's, it's about as simple as this. All right? Here's the challenge. I love, I, this is actually a blast. I, I single you out because of the questions you ask. But there are others who might want to consider this as well. Solve that in parallel, not using the tasks. All right? So you can use parallel. You can use parallel four. You can use sync. I don't care. Anything but the task construct. Walk a linked list and do this. You've got a while loop. Notice, we don't have a pragma OMP parallel while. Right? You have four, but not while. Okay. So go ahead, figure out what you have to do to do this with regular OpenMP, and then do it with tasks. And it's actually an incredibly valuable exercise. And you'll walk out of that, one, really understanding tasks, and two, really loving tasks. Because <laughs> this is not easy to do. Yes, I could have a, an ID, and I could, I could do this SPMD style, and I can walk the list once and figure out pointers. To, oh, it, believe me. Ugh. But it, it's a valuable exercise. You, you should do it. Okay. It's like using P threads to do loop level parallelism. Yeah. Wrong tool for the job. So at, at, at any rate, let, let me go a little further, then I'll come back to questions. OK. So I've talked about how the task construct gathers up the data environment. We'll talk about that in a moment. All right. 
packages it up into a task, and it may either execute it or defer it. You know, once again, we have to, you know, the worst thing you can do in defining any kind of computer language is to overspecify. All right, we have to give flexibility for an implementation to do the right thing. So the implementation may say, you know, I'm just going to do this task right now and be done with it. Or it may put it into a queue to defer its execution. All right? So I talked about how you start tasks. Let's talk about when they're guaranteed to complete. So tasks are guaranteed to be complete at the following associated barriers, task barriers. All right? So if I have a pragma OMP barrier construct, I have the barrier implied at the end of a single. Okay, if you get to a barrier within the team of threads where all the teams have to gather, the, the tasks are going to have to complete at that point. All right? Or I can have a task barrier called a task weight, which says the tasks generated by the current task, it's going to wait until they complete. All right? Now here comes a subtlety. This is a fun subtlety. All right? We distinguish between sibling tasks and descendant tasks. What do I mean by that? All right? Think back to that while loop back here. All right? The sibling tasks are the tasks created within the scope of this single. Okay? Sibling tasks are created in the same scope as each other, is how I would think of it. A descendant task would be what if inside this process it creates additional tasks? Those would be descendant tasks. So task wait says we're going to wait for all the sibling tasks to complete. Be careful with the way you phrase that because it might make one think if you, if you had a structured block there that then instead of process P, if you had open curly brace, do something with P, and then pound pragma task P, that that, that inner task is a sibling task, right. but it's, it's not. It's not. It, That's it, right. It's basically, it's all the tasks that are spawned by the same task. Tim's avoided telling you that all of the threads are being executed by implicit tasks. So that guy, that single is actually a task, and it's generating tasks. The tasks that it's, it generates could generate tasks. Those are the descendants, but not the siblings, right? Did I confuse everybody hopelessly? Let's get a head nod. Did he confuse you hopelessly? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to get to your question in a, in, in a moment. Right, right, in, in a moment. Let, I want to get through a couple more examples. Let me tell you something. My opinion, the only way to learn tasks is to beat yourself up with them. Pick a piece of code and write it with the tasks. You can hear me talk about it. You can look at examples. But until you actually play with them, it's really hard to learn them. So it's very important tonight, when we, you know, after dinner and you do the examples, you, you pick one of the task exercises. Um, so we'll say a couple more things about the tasks, and then we'll go through and answer questions. So I'm going to defer the questions a little bit. Here I'm going to have Pragma OMP Parallel. Got to create a team of threads or nothing's going to happen. I'm going to create a, a for loop, Pragma OMP4. And now I have a pragma OMP task, which is just going to call the function foo. All right? It doesn't have to be a while loop to create tasks. So I'm going to create a whole bunch of tasks inside this for loop. All right? Now, all of those tasks are guaranteed to complete by the implied barrier right here. All right? Very, very simple. So now I come back into this next part, and I'm going to create a whole bunch of tasks once again. Now I've got a single. Only one of them is going to create the tasks. And they're all guaranteed to complete at the end of that barrier. Most of the ways you use tasks, that, that's a very common way to run into it. All right? But here's another example. So here's an absolutely terrible way to generate the Fibonacci sequence. But almost everyone talking about tasking uses some version of this. All right? So here I have a function. And uh, uh, let's assume that you know, it's called by value, so n's coming in, and it's private. So I'm going to have int x and y. I'm going to have if n is less than 2, I'm going to create, uh, I'm going to return just n, because the Fibonacci sequence if n is less than 2 is, is the equal to n. So Fibonacci sequence for n equals 0 or n equals 1 is 0 or 1. So then I'm going to have one task that, that generates the Fibonacci sequence for n minus 1. 
another task that generates the Fibonacci sequence for n equals 2. I want to wait for both of these to finish because I want to return the sum of those two. Right? If you just think about the definition of the Fibonacci sequence. Okay? But I got something wrong here. Can you see what it is? X and Y are private. So what happens to them when they leave the scope of the task? So x and y are private, so their values are not defined once they get out of the tasks. All right? So this is where the data scope comes in. So what I want to do for this is I want to make sure that inside my Fibonacci sequence that the scope of x and y, if they're private coming in, I want to make sure that they're not private coming out and they're visible so that return statement can sum them. All right? So I go shared x, shared y. Now they're visible. And then that task wait that waits until they're both done and sums them up, and off I go. Let me say a little bit more about data scoping with tasks, and we'll pause for questions. So I find it gets kind of confusing. But if a variable is shared, the references inside are shared, and they see the value at the point the task was encountered, and they're going to exist when you leave the scope. If a variable is private on a task construct, all right, so I have a private variable. I come into a task construct. It will be private and uninitialized where the task is executed. It will see the value where the task is executed. If it's first private, then the references inside of it are to new storage, but it's going to incorporate the value of when the task was encountered. All right, if you think about the way tasks work, that's probably the most common case you want. So the behavior you usually want is first private. You encounter a task. You want to capture the value of the variables in that data environment when you saw that task. So typical behavior you want is first private. So variables that are private when a task is encountered are made first private by default. All right? And variables that are shared when you hit the, uh, that are shared in the enclosing parallel region when you hit the task construct remain shared. Here's an example. Okay, I'm going to walk through a list, pragma OMP parallel, pragma OMP signal, single. I'm going to create these tasks. What do you think is wrong here? What's the data environment for that task? Well, if E is shared, I'm updating it by multiple tasks. Right? Because I'm processing E and doing processing on E, it's shared. I have a race condition. So what I'll do with this example is I'll make it first private. So now I'm explicitly saying I want to make sure that each task, when I create it, captures the value of E. And so when I defer the task for execution later on, it captures the value of E at the point I encounter the task and saves that and bundles it up with the task. So I make it first private, which I could do the same thing if I made it private right there. Uh, then I'd get the first private by default. And I think at this point, I'm just making it more confusing. Now, questions on tasks. So you, you uh, said that the sibling tasks would complete at the barrier and not the descendants. But is there any way for a task to complete without its descendants complete? Yes, we will talk about. So wait. with. With its descendants completing. Oh, yeah, sure. A, task, a, a set of sibling tasks can complete, and then they will have created other tasks that can keep executing. If you want everything to execute, we have a construct called a task group. And this is getting into latter features in, in OpenMP. But there is a way for you to say, all of these tasks are executing in a task group, and the task group is not complete until all the tasks, including the descendants, are, are complete. I, I guess I'm confused about what, what, at what barrier these descendant tasks will be guaranteed to execute. Um, that's a good question. Do you... I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand here. So if I have descendant tasks and um, I, I, the, the question is, if I have tasks that are creating tasks, and so that I have sibling tasks and descendant tasks, when are those descendant tasks done if I don't have the task group construct? Is it the barrier of the parallel region when they be done? 
if you don't have a barrier before that, yes. Okay. So at the, uh, yeah.